Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Rock Bottom Airsoft. It's good to see you again. If it's your first time here, then it is good to see you and I hope you're going to stick around. I'll have to apologise straight away if my voice sounds a bit funny on this uh, video. I'm still getting over the bugs that I had. Uh, I think I've had a bit of a cold. Um, I've done a Covid test, so thankfully it's, uh, it's not Covid, so that's always good. Um, Unfortunately, we're back at our midweek video here in the studio. Uh, my injuries, my previous injuries are still here, so I'm still unable to get out to my regular game on the field. So we're going to do another studio video today. As many of you know, if you follow the channel, we normally do a studio video at a weekend um, and a gameplay video midweek. But at the moment, we're doing two studio videos a week. So I hope you enjoy that and we discuss all things Airsoft and everything in between. So if you are enjoying what you're seeing and you've been following the channel, then please do subscribe and that way you won't miss any of my uploads and uh, it helps me out as well. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, what are we going to look at today? Well, today uh, I get a lot of questions uh, from some of my friends and some of the players that I meet when I'm out at my regular games or if I'm visiting my site uh, where I play, my home site, Tasbo Airsoft. As you all know, that's where I play. Um, about upgrades. Um, there's a lot of things on social media as well about upgrades. Um, I thought what we'd do is today, I haven't got a gearbox that I'm working on at the moment, but I am going to do a run through on how to strip one down and, and, and how to rebuild a gearbox. That video will be coming soon. Uh, but what I thought we'd look at today is look at the different parts of an electric gearbox. We're not going to cover the electrical system in this video. We're, we're only going to look at the actual gearbox components. We'll have a quick look how much they cost, whether they're worth putting in, uh, whether they're worth upgrading indeed, um, and what effect they should have on the overall system, as it were, the overall gearbox and what you're looking to obtain from it. We're not going to go massively in depth. There's a lot more to it than some of the things I'm going to go through here. But what we'll do is, is we'll go through the more in depth details as we start looking at a particular build. Because it all really boils down to what you're hoping to achieve and what you want to get out of a, of a gearbox when you start to upgrade your replica. Some upgrades are not even requiring gearbox opening. Um, you can get range, accuracy, things like that sometimes from simple modifications that we've covered before without opening the gearbox. One other thing that I want to mention before we start is that I'm not going to look at the gearbox shell itself. That obviously is an important part of any gearbox. Maybe the most important because it holds everything in, you know? Uh, but your gearbox shell if you've got a steel gearbox shell or a metal gearbox shell of any description that comes with any halfway decent automatic electric gun or AEG replica, then I, d I wouldn't recommend upgrading it. Unless you're going completely up extreme, then you know the gearbox shell that came with your replica should be absolutely fine. We can go into details of radiusing gearboxes and things like that when we get into a particular build. But I've noticed with a lot of the newer replicas now, any any halfway decent replica, even at budget end, they normally come with a, a radius gearbox shell anyway. Some shells are weaker than others, but until your gearbox shell actually breaks, I don't think it's worth changing it. Like I say, unless you're going completely extreme and we're not going to be looking at that right now. Okay, so don't worry if I haven't covered gearbox shells because you should already have one and you should be okay to use the shell that you have. If you are reusing the shell that you have, the only thing that I would say is if you're going to be doing a build, it's always worth degreasing it and cleaning it, everything out inside so that you can apply your own grease. But again, greases and oils is not something we're looking at here. We're not looking at a build. We're just going to have a look at parts. So let's get into it. Let's start at the top and uh, and work our way down. Now I've got a few boxes of bits and pieces here of, uh, of items that I've either taken out of replicas or spurs that I have lying around. It's always handy to have all your parts uh, readily available. Now the first thing that we're going to look at from the top down is your spring. This is an AG spring. They come in different types. Um, there's not really a huge amount to worry about on a spring. The most important thing to remember with the spring is that it is your power source. That is what's pushing the piston forward. That's what's causing the amount of air that you're pushing through. There's more to it than that, but at a base level, a spring is really there for power. 
And that's what you're looking at. Your spring can have a direct contributory effect on the power that your replica puts out or the feet per second that it's firing out or the joules. But basically the muzzle energy that's coming out is due to your spring primarily. Springs normally you'll see things like M90 or M100 or M120. What that basically refers to is, is meters per second. So an M90 spring should be rated at about 90 meters per second, but generally that doesn't always work in practice because of other factors in your replica. Um, however, the larger the number, the stronger the spring is. So the larger the number, the more power that spring in theory should produce in your replica. But obviously you've got to remember that with a heavier spring, you're going to put a lot more strain on other components within your gearbox. But that's the first part we can look at inside the gearbox is the spring. The spring creates power. And that's primarily what we're looking at with that. Price wise, you can go varied really on a spring. You're looking around about 10 British pounds. 10 British pounds will get you a spring in various types. Um, and then, you know, you get differing pitches and things like that. But we won't go into that. That's all we're looking at. The spring is your power supply. And, you know, remember to get an M-rated spring at a rating that you're looking to get. You know, so, I mean, if you want massively high power, then obviously you can put a big spring in. But it's going to cause stress to other components. So that's worth remembering. So that's the AG spring. <clears throat> They're pretty much interchangeable between all replicas. Um, they're just differing grades of power that you're putting through them. So that's the first part. So what's next after the spring? Well, next after we've had a look at the spring, your spring runs on a spring guide within the gearbox. And we'll get this one out here and then we can have a look at it. This is a steel ball bearing spring guide. Now, when we're looking at spring guides, the primary purpose of upgrading your spring guide would be reliability. If you already have a metal spring guide in your particular gearbox, then, you know, don't change it. It's, it's really not worth changing if you already have a metal spring guide. Most spring guides will have some sort of slipping function. Might not be bearings like this one. You can see it rotates at the bottom here. Uh, but they'll, they'll have something there that acts as a bearing. Um, if you have a plastic spring guide, then I strongly recommend to replace it with a metal spring guide. These can be specific. They are version two gearboxes, version three, version four. You, you, you know, your particular replica will have the version gearbox that you're working on. If you're working on an AR pattern replica, they're a version two gearbox. The version two gearbox is by far and away the most common, followed by the version three gearbox, which you find in AKs and G36s and things like that. Now, Check your specific replica so you get the correct spring guide. That goes for a lot of the parts here. Uh, but if you have a plastic spring guide, which you normally find in some Simons and things like that, then upgrade it to a metal spring guide. And if you're upgrading it, it's well worth getting a ball bearing spring guide. The purpose of that is to stop spring twist when the spring is being compressed. So a spring guide is a well worth upgrade. This doesn't really relate to anything other than reliability because a metal spring guide is not going to break whereas a plastic spring guide is eventually going to break. You will get a slight increase in power sometimes with a ball bearing spring guide because it puts some pressure on the spring. It pre-compresses it if you like uh, so it's harder to force back so it flies forward a bit quicker. So it can give you a little bit of bump in power uh, but primarily we change the spring guide for reliability and it's well worth doing because a broke spring guide is bad news. If you have a quick release spring guide, it'll probably be metal anyway, in which case you don't need to change it. But if there's an upgrade option for your particular replica for a metal one and it is plastic, then I strongly recommend going for some sort of metal spring guide, bearing or not. But the bearings are worth having if you're upgrading anyway. Spring guides, yeah, you're looking at between 13 to 20 British pounds for a for an halfway decent metal spring guide. So that's that next bit done. So sticking with that part of the gearbox, uh, compression components, I suppose you could call them, we could then next look at the piston. Now pistons come in different flavors. These are pistons. This one's a bit more easy to see. 
That is a full metal rack piston. This one is a seven tooth piston. What they basically mean by that is piston teeth can come in different numbers. The most common you'll come across normally in an AEG gearbox is 14 or 15 teeth pistons is what they have as standard. If they're 14 tooth, it just means they've had one removed uh, for what they call AOE or angle of engagement. Now, as I say, I'm not gonna go into all of that today because we only look at angle of engagement if we need to adjust it. Um, so if you're just buying components or just wondering what components are worth upgrading or indeed what the different upgrades people are referring to are, that's all we're covering today. So as a rule, your piston really boils down primarily to reliability. Um, you can also get speed or rounds per second dependent on the build you're looking at. Now this one here is a solid piston. This one here has been Swiss cheesed as we call it or drilled out to make the piston lighter. However, this piston will be slightly heavier because it's a full metal rack. And what we mean by a full metal rack is all the teeth on the piston are metal. This seven tooth piston means it has seven metal teeth. Now, you can go with full metal for maximum reliability because a common fault on replicas is eventually you'll strip the teeth off your piston and then obviously your sector gear can't draw the piston back anymore. So with a metal rack, you've got longevity and reliability and that is primarily why people go with metal rack pistons. Now me personally, whether you agree or disagree, everybody has their own opinion on it, but I like to have a point of failure in my replicas that isn't too expensive. You can get these pistons for, for varying amounts of money, but around about 10 British pounds seems to be average. You can get one of these ones for about six or seven pounds, uh, depending on where you get it from. SHS pistons are superb. This Rocket piston, it's basically the same manufacturer in China, just by a different name. Uh, but the SHS pistons are superb. They tend to be polymer. Um, you will see aluminium pistons and steel pistons. Don't get those. Aluminium and steel pistons are, are next to useless in our airsoft replicas. I'll not go into all the reasons why, but just believe me when I say that you don't want any kind of metal piston. The polymer ones are far better. Where teeth are concerned, it's a choice for yourself. I tend to not go with full metal racks because if something's gonna fail in my replica, I'd rather it strip the piston than strip my sector gear or anything else. Primarily because pistons are so cheap and relatively easy to replace. Don't have to look at shimming or anything when I replace a piston. Um, so yeah, if you want maximum reliability, then go with a full metal rack. If you want a point of failure, same as me, then you know go with a polymer pistol uh, piston. Sorry, but make sure that you, you you know you have a number of metal teeth in there. I usually go with uh, seven teeth. You know that that gives you a good bit of longevity while at the same time offering a point of failure. There's arguments both sides with it, but that's what you're looking at on pistons. Make sure you get a polymer one, make sure that you get the number of teeth that you want in, in metal, um, and, and don't buy full metal bodied pistons. They look cool, but they're, to be honest, they're absolutely useless in an airsoft AEG. They're, they're not really any use for what we're trying to achieve here. So that's pistons. Pistons, primarily reliability. If you're building a high speed build, then you want your piston as light as possible so it returns as quickly as possible and voids pre-engagement. But again, I'm not gonna go into all that because that would relate to a specific build. We're just looking at the parts in the gearbox, which is the piston in this case. Pistons, get polymer, get the number of teeth you want, either full metal rack or partial metal rack, and that's you. Pistons are pretty much interchangeable between most gearbox versions, so you shouldn't have a problem getting hold of one of these. The SHS ones are particularly good, and you want polymer. So that's pistons, that's the next thing we've, we've had a look at there. And that all boils down to reliability. Okay, so what we're gonna look at next after we've had a look at the, uh, the piston there, well, what attaches to the piston? On a piston, you will have a piston head, uh, now, I don't have a, an aftermarket piston head to show you, uh, but I do have a standard Sima piston with the piston head still attached. You see there's a screw in the end here, and this part with the O-ring here, that is the piston head that attaches onto the piston body, and that creates air seal between the cylinder wall 
obviously as the piston flies forward that compresses the air pushes the air through to eventually your BB which pushes it down the barrel. So a piston head's very important. Now the cyber piston heads normally are actually very good. Um, piston heads you can upgrade them, you can buy parts. If you're getting a good air seal with the piston head that you have uh, then I would recommend not to upgrade it. Um, you know that it's all down to air seal with a piston head and that's all down to power and consistency. For accuracy in an airsoft replica, consistency is key. If you can get your FPS being very similar, shot after shot, then your BBs are going to be going at the same range and roughly in the same spot each time you fire. There's a bit more to it than that, but consistency is a very important part of it. And air seal is a big part of consistency and also power. If you've got a massive spring in your gearbox, but you're not sealing your cylinder and there's not enough air getting down the barrel, then obviously your power is going to be low. So that's why I said that it, there's a lot of things work together. Your spring power directly affects the power output of the muzzle, but also so does air seal. So piston head, that boils down to air seal, which is power and consistency, and is an important component. So check your air seal if you're building, and if you want to upgrade your piston head, you can get double o-ring piston heads, vented piston heads, all sorts of things. You can get aluminium piston heads. Some of my builds run an aluminium piston head and I've had good results with them. Uh, but there's some arguments to say that you're better off with a polymer piston head because as the piston's hitting the gearbox, it puts less stress and less energy through the gearbox so it's less likely to crack your gearbox. And there's arguments to say that it can make your, your, your gun slightly quieter as well because obviously you don't have metal impact in there. So that's the, uh, the, the piston head. That's that component there. The piston head, you can be looking at around about phew, 10 British pounds up. Uh, you can spend a lot of money on a piston head, but around about 10 British pounds should get you a decent one. So that's the next thing there, the spring and piston. So, out comes after the piston head. After the piston head, we will be looking at the cylinder head. Now this is a cylinder head for a version 2 gearbox. It's an Action Army one, they're a decent brand. This one is aluminium, you can get them in plastic. Um, you know, that really, to be honest, there's arguments for plastic or aluminium. Aluminium will give you a bit of longevity, looks nice, not that anybody will really see it. Uh, but I tend to like aluminium cylinder heads, and I like them with the double O-ring. You can see how there's two O-rings on that cylinder head. Now, if I get a standard Sima cylinder head out here, which is plastic, you can see on this version 2 cylinder head it only has one o-ring whereas this aftermarket one has two o-rings. The argument being that two o-rings is going to give you better air seal than one o-ring. And again the cylinder head is all about air seal, it's part of your air seal components. That gives you, as we mentioned, power and consistency. So the cylinder head is an important part and if you have bad air seal when you're checking your components, then the cylinder head can contribute to air seal. So it's it's worth changing if you have poor air seal. I've had good results with the Action Army, with SHS, most brands of aluminium cylinder head, I've had good results with, and I've had good results with some of the stock cylinder heads as well. And all this does is sit in the end of your cylinder, sealing it up, your piston comes forward, compresses the air, passes it through, which comes out towards your barrel. You can get a decent cylinder head, you're looking between 10 and 15 British pounds for a cylinder head. Make sure you get the cylinder head that's specific to your replica. Um, this is where you can have variation, for example a version 3 and version 2 cylinder head do not match. So make sure you get the right one, that's a version 2 cylinder head. I will put some links in the description as to where I get some of my parts from and to some of the version 2 parts being the most common. Um, then you know where you can start with those. But the cylinder head, again, air seal, consistency and power is what that directly affects. Okay, so moving on, what attaches to the cylinder head? Well, after the cylinder head, we have something called the nozzle or loading nozzle. Now, I should have one of these lying around somewhere. Let's see if we can get a nozzle out for you. The nozzle again is an air seal component and relates directly to power. This is a nozzle. 
very difficult to see in my hands there, my black gloves. Uh, the nozzle basically fits over the end of your cylinder head. Here we have another aluminium cylinder head that I don't have in use, it's a double o-ring. So the nozzle sits over the cylinder head like that, um, and then basically as your gun fires, this is moved by the tappet plate which moves back and forth, that basically is going to load your BBs, but obviously you need a good seal between here and the inside of here, otherwise air is going to escape out of there, so that's why it's part of your air seal components, and again, directly reflects against power and consistency. Now that is a standard nozzle, nozzles come in various guises, you can get them in plastic or aluminium, you can also get them with double o-rings, there are advantages to double o-rings again because there's an argument that it gives you a better seal, sometimes it isn't, you have to check your air seal yourself, if your air seal is fine and you've got good air seal then these components don't need to be upgraded, but if you are upgrading then that is what we mean by nozzle. Nozzles come in different lengths, they can be specific to particular gearboxes, I believe this is a version 3 gearbox nozzle out of a stair org. Now, do make sure you get the right nozzle length. If you have to measure the nozzle that's in, and then compare it to nozzles that are available online or from your supplier, then do that. If you get your nozzle length wrong, you're going to have poorer seal when it meets the booking, of your hop up, you're also going to have feeding issues and it can cause a lot of problems having the wrong nozzle length. So things to remember with a nozzle is whether you want aluminium or plastic, doesn't make a lot of difference really, get a bit more longevity you could argue with an aluminium one but it'll cost you a bit more. As long as the air seal is good on your nozzle to your cylinder head then that's what you're after whether it be single o-ring or double o-ring, plastic or aluminium and you want to make sure you get the correct length for your particular replica, okay? So that's the nozzle. So that's the next of the air seal components directly affecting power and consistency. If you're looking to buy a nozzle, you're looking anywhere between seven and 10 British pounds. You may get them cheaper, depends whether you want aluminium or plastic, and whether you want single or double O-ring. I believe the ASG performance line ones are double O-ring and they're plastic, whereas some others are metal. Um, so that's that's that part of the air seal components looked at. And then the final part, not including, as I said earlier, barrel or hop up or bucking or nubs, because we're not looking at that, we're looking at gearbox parts. But the final part of the air seal process, as far as gearboxes are concerned, is your cylinder. Now the cylinder is what your piston runs in. For a complete air seal package, you would have your piston head, which sits in the cylinder, obviously this is only rough, and then you would have, I'm trying to get these parts out of here for you guys, and you would have your piston head attached to your piston, which moves in and out of the cylinder. You'll notice that this cylinder is ported. You get different cylinders with different port settings, dependent primarily on the length of your barrel so that you get the correct volume of air. If you under volume or more over volume, then that can affect power and consistency and accuracy. So it's well worth making sure you get the correct one. If you're in doubt, stick with the same length of barrel that was in there already and the standard cylinder. The only reason really you'd change a cylinder is if you're going for something specific, if you're increasing the volume and you, you, you want a non-ported cylinder, or, or vice versa if you're going for a smaller barrel and you need a ported cylinder. Or if your cylinder's got scratches in it, you want to make sure the cylinder is nice and smooth inside. Again, this is a standard Sima cylinder out of an AR-based replica. But that is your cylinder. Now, if you were wanting to upgrade your cylinder, which again, I suppose directly relates to power more than anything um, and consistency because it is part of the air seal um, you know that, that directly relates to power so if you were going to upgrade it you, you'd be looking between 10 to 12 pounds really mm. while we've got those together if you did want to check air seal when you are doing any work all you really do is put your nozzle over the end there and then push down rapidly as you can see the air seal on this setup was absolutely shocking when you push the piston down then the piston should have resistance and you shouldn't be able to push it forward that means you're getting good air seal um, but the air seal on these components was terrible which is why they're in my spurs so that's why we changed them 
So after we've gone through the cylinder, that really gets us away now from air seal components as far as the gearbox is concerned. Next up, moving down from the top of the gearbox down, you will come across something called a tappet plate. <clears throat> this is a tappet plate. <clears throat> this tappet plate is aftermarket, by Rocket, same manufacturer as SHS. Um, yeah, all the tappet plate basically does is it's got a notch on your sector gear that pulls it back and a spring that lets it go forward. And that's what moves the nozzle that we mentioned earlier. And it moves the nozzle to allow a BB to feed and then be sealed up against the nozzle for good air seal. This part doesn't relate to air seal. It relates to timing, um, but primarily reliability. Standard clear plastic tappet plates can break, I've had a number of them break on me, whereas these aftermarket polymer ones they tend to be a lot stronger. Um, tappet plate timing is something you can get into if you're doing high speed builds and the like, but generally the tappet plate, if it isn't broke, you shouldn't need to change it, but if you want a bit more reliability, you can change it to an aftermarket one such as this, and it'll last you a bit longer, it's less likely to break. So tappet plates, they boil down to reliability, uh, about five pounds, five British pounds for one of those. Again, if yours isn't broke, I probably wouldn't bother changing it, to be honest. So next up, we've got the big stuff. <laughs> um, moving down the gearbox again, we get into gears. Now these are a set of standard gears, stock gears, out of one of my replicas that's been upgraded. Uh, these gears or a standard 18 to 1 setup, you get different ratios of gears. The lower the, uh, the numbers, as it were, then generally the faster the gears will be. A uh, 12 to 1 gear set is going to be much faster than, say, uh, 18 to 1 gear set. So that's what you're looking at when you're looking at the numbers on gears. That is the very basics of it. The lower that first number, the higher speed that gear set is going to make your replica. So, what do we look at with gears? Well, gears can affect a lot of things. Gears are definitely part of reliability. If you have a poor set of gears that are badly worn, or indeed a cheap set of gears that break, if you break teeth off, that's going to cause you all sorts of problems. Those bits of metal will be flying around in your gearbox. If you are not wanting to change the speed of your replica, then, or indeed putting in a really high power spring such as in a DMR build, there's really no need to change your gears until they get damaged if they're, if they're metal gears. Uh, the Sima gears are particularly strong, these are a set of Sima gears. Um, again, the reason I would change gears is if I've got a poor set of gears and they need replacement, or if I was looking at doing a high speed build, I might put 13 to 1 or 12 to 1 gears in it. You'll have heard of DSG builds, that only refers to this gear here, but again, you'd change gears for that. Um, or if I was doing a DMR build where I was putting like a really heavy spring in, then I would look to change to a stronger set of gears that can take the strain of drawing back that, that heavy spring. Now with gears, you've got three main gears. We won't include the pinion gear, the pinion gear is attached to the motor, but in your actual gearbox, these gears, you've got your spur gear, you've got your bevel gear, and you've got your sector gear. This is meshes with the, the pinion gear on your motor. This one meshes to this bevel gear, which drives the sector gear here. And the sector gear, because it only has a sector of teeth, that is what draws the piston back on the rack that we mentioned earlier. Now gears can get very expensive. I like SHS gears because here on Rock Bottom Airsoft we try and do things affordably and they have always worked well for me and been pretty strong. Uh, gears you can spend from 20 British pounds up to maybe over 100 pounds dependent on the set of gears that you're looking to buy and the manufacturer. Um, as I say 20 pounds would probably be my absolute bottom level for a set of gears. That's when you're getting into the SHS realms of maybe 25, 30 pounds for, for a set of high speed SHS gears, such as 12 to 1. What I would say is, 
is this component is part of reliability and speed. That's primarily what your gears are going to affect. The, the gear ratio will affect the rate of fire of your replica quite substantially. But again, there's a lot goes along with putting in those gears. Don't just put 12 to 1 gears in an otherwise standard replica because you need to have a motor and an electrical system that can cope with the additional stresses of a lower ratio gear. If your gears are good quality, then I wouldn't change them until they break. If they're metal gears, again, I wouldn't change them till they break. Unless, of course, you're looking at a high power, high muzzle energy replica like a DMR, or you're looking at a high speed build. And that's it, that's gears. So, very simple, not much to them. They're just a very pricey part of your replica. You don't want them to break, ideally and they can have a massive effect on the rate of fire of your replica. So, moving down again. Next up, we have the anti-reversal latch. This component does nothing more than reliability. It stops the gearbox spinning in reverse after you've fired a shot. So it rotates only one way. You do not want it rotating the wrong way. So the anti-reversal latch, very simply, prevents that from happening, prevents it doing reverse rotation after firing. If your anti-reversal latch is broke, then replace it. If it isn't, and it's metal, then leave it be. Unless, again, you're going for a very high stress build, and then it might be worth replacing with an aftermarket item, such as this SHS one, because it'll probably be a little bit stronger than the standard one that's in there. Not in all cases, be perfectly honest with you, I never change an anti-reversal latch unless it's broke, or unless it's really, really badly damaged. Um, if you're going to change the anti-reversal latch, you're looking at about five British pounds, probably less than that. You'll probably get one for under five British pounds, but I wouldn't pay any more than that for an anti-reversal latch. It does a very simple job, very important job, but if yours is intact and not damaged, then probably not worth changing. And then we get on to the next part of your gearbox build, which you, you might class it as a little bit more boring, to be honest. Um, it's not a very exciting component. Let me see if I've got some spurs rattling around in one of these boxes. Here we go. That is bushings. These are SHS bushings. You'll have to check your particular gearbox shell on what size your bushings are. They come in different sizes, such as six, seven, eight millimeter. Um, if you're going to be doing high speed or looking at burrings, then I'd recommend a minimum of seven millimeter bushings. That would be a reason to change your gearbox casing if it's only got six mil bushings you still probably get away with it to be honest but usually gearboxes don't come with that smaller bushing nine times out of ten uh, so yeah make sure you get the bushings that are correct size for your gearbox to be perfectly honest if you've got metal bushings in your gearbox already then don't change them the only time i would change these is if i have plastic bushings such as on the stair rogue when i worked on that one it had polymer bushings and they just don't stand the test of time. So I changed it out for, for these SHS steel bushings. Uh, you could also put burrings in. Uh, burrings are another option. It's the same again on sizings. Burrings can be a little more fragile than a bushing, but if you install them correctly and you shim your gearbox up correctly, they'll probably last you just as long as a bushing. But bushings are just easier to work with in general because they're solid. Uh, if you put a bushing in, it shouldn't break on you. Uh, make sure you get the correct size bushing, make sure they're hammered correctly into the gearbox, and again, only change them if you're either wanting to upgrade to bearings and you're going for a high speed build, or if you're wanting to put higher quality bushings in, whatever your reasons, you don't really need to change them. If you've got metal bushings in your gearbox already and they're correctly seated, I will not bother changing them to be honest, unless you're going for something extreme. So bushings only really need changing, if you've got polymer bushings in, and the sole purpose of a bushing really is its reliability. They protect your gearbox from the spinning of the shafts on your gears, and they stop the gearbox wearing away basically. So bushings, reliability, purely reliability and strength. So only change those if you don't have metal bushings. Again, you know, I've put five pounds, British pounds here for a set of bushings. Burrings might be a little bit more expensive, but generally they're not very expensive. You can pay a lot of money for some burrings, uh, but bushings generally, they're pretty affordable. Uh, around about five British pounds will get you a full set of bushings for, for a gearbox. 
But again, you only really need to change those if, you know, there's something wrong with the ones you've got. And then last, but by no means least, we have shims. Now shims are these little slivers of metal that go on the shafts of your gears and they allow the gears to mesh properly while also allowing the gears to spin freely in the bushings without catching on the gearbox casing or, or on each other. Um, they're not really an upgrade, uh, but one of the biggest upgrades you can do to a gearbox, a standard gearbox, is if it's sounding slightly rough, is re-shim the gearbox, which is why I've included shims here. If you're buying shims, make sure that you get a good selection of sizes. It doesn't really matter about the brand you get. There's not much to them. They're just metal. They're just little metal discs with a hole in them. <laughs> um, some people argue some shims are better than others. I've used all sorts of brand of shim. Never really had any problems with any of them. Um, you're looking, yeah, no, next to nothing for shims. You should be paying a few British pounds, not a lot of money for a set of shims. Uh, make sure you have a good set of shims, and then you can shim up your gearbox. So there we go. I, I think we've pretty much covered everything to do with the, the components, the main primary components within a gearbox that you might want to look to upgrade. So I hope that's helped if you were confused as to some of these parts that some people may mention. And I hope it's helped as to whether they're worth upgrading or whether they're parts that you might want to, to invest in if you are looking at doing a gearbox build. Now as I say, I will look at doing a build step by step through a gearbox when I've got one in that I'm working on. And I'll put that on video so I can show you how to do the various jobs on there. And um, we'll do another video maybe this weekend on the electrical components in a gearbox that you can look to upgrade and whether they're part of reliability or power or consistency or even speed. Um, but like I say, I hope we've covered the main ones there. If I have missed anything that you'd like to know about, then do drop me a comment below. I'll always respond to comments. I might not get back to you straight away, but I will respond. Uh, if you have any questions for me in general, then yeah, do drop a comment below. I will look to get back to you. And as always, if you want any more content from myself, you can find Rock Bottom Airsoft on Facebook and Instagram. And if you did enjoy the video today, which I hope you did, and I hope you found it useful, then do please drop a like on the video. It helps me to grow this channel. Um, but other than that, thanks very much for watching, and I will look forward to seeing you in the next one.